Hi, everyone. So uh, Phil Travis here, um, here at EOU, Modern, Modern Russia, History 448. Um, today's uh, presentation is on the Soviet bloc in the 1950s. So the Soviet bloc, um, when we say that, generally we usually refer to the Warsaw Pact. And of course here you have pictured the Warsaw Pact in red and, and the lighter red. And of course um, in the blue we have the NATO states. And of course in the gray you have, you, you, of course you have uh, Sweden and Finland in the north in the gray. These are non-aligned states. Uh, Switzerland and Austria in the gray. And of course also Yugoslavia. Which is, um, which is the large state across the border with Italy, which was, of course, a non-aligned socialist state that resisted um, being brought into the Warsaw Pact. Um, Warsaw Pact, of course, includes East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, um, Ukraine, Belarus, and so forth. Um, and of course, in East Germany, if you can see in East Germany, you can see the little blue dot, and that would be Berlin, which was, of course, a city that, as the Cold War developed, that city became kind of a microcosm of of the of the of the divide that was developing um, in the world between those affiliated with the Western Bloc and the United States and those affiliated with um, the Soviet Communist Bloc. And the numbers you see here are, are, are military numbers. So these are, these are troop levels. So the map itself depicts, you know, Warsaw was 1954. It was a reaction to NATO, which had been formed in the late 40s. And um, it was really the, milita the militarized divide of, uh, of Europe along the lines of the Cold War between the Warsaw Pact and NATO as the Soviet Union and the United States increasingly were unable to cooperate and increasingly militarized um, against one another and facilitated the division of, of the region and, and to a large degree the world as well. The Soviet system, um, of course, and of course you guys know this from what we've read already, but the Soviet system um, in the late 40s and the in the 1950s up till Stalin's death is what we would call a totalitarian system. Um, so take a second and think about how a totalitarian system is, might be different from a dictatorship. So, and, and of course you see in this huge statue here um, in Prague, um, Stalin, um, kind of an aspect of the cult of personality, which was oftentimes, is oftentimes a characteristic of, of, a, total, of a totalitarian system. Um, it's a system based on total state control. Um, usually it involves planned economics. Um, these are not all, these all do not have to be the case, but oftentimes planned economics, um, one party, um, control of individual freedoms of press, speech, religion, etc. And usually a cult of personality that dominates and directs the country. Um, Jean Kirkpatrick, who is the, U the first female ambassador to the UN from the United States, who had, she became UN ambassador during the Reagan administration, um, kind of um, discussed this difference between dictatorship and totalitarianism in her, in her article and later book, Dictatorships and Double Standards. Um, somewhat controversial work, but nonetheless points out some key factors in how one might define um, a totalitarian state. Of course, I think one thing that's been kind of ringing true in our readings of service this term is that Stalin's attempts at creating a totalitarian state, um, that he's never really able to truly do it, that people are still individuals and they find ways to react and kind of whittle out their own um, individuality despite incredible um, oppression and control from the, from the Stalin-led state apparatus. On March 4th, 1953, Stalin died. And of course, Stalin's death was um, an interesting story in and of itself. Um, everybody was so fearful of Stalin that when Stalin died, Stalin had a stroke and uh, his, his colleagues basically left him, a lot. they left him in there knowing he was collapsed. They left him in there um, and he, you know, he might have been able to survive had he had help, but he doesn't have medical help for a long period of time because his colleagues were so fearful 
of, of, of Stalin that um, nobody wanted to be the one who found him because the one who found him would probably be the one that would be sent to Berea and would be tortured and, uh, and perhaps killed or sent to the gulags being blamed for it. Nikita Khrushchev um, had come out of Nikita Khrushchev had come out of um, out of Stalin's Politburo, and he was a leader at Stalingrad. Um, he was an individual who was deeply fearful as well of nuclear war. Um, Khrushchev told tales of Stalin having meetings of his top council, um, in which Stalin would get everybody drunk; that they would drink vodka, and Stalin would drink maybe a couple of drinks, and everybody else would basically be knocking back, you know, a fifth or something, you know. And Khrushchev said this was one of ways of Stalin to try to root out potential, um, potential disloyal individuals who might again be sent to Berea and be tortured. Stalin's leadership was brutal, and uh, he, you know, Khrushchev had said that in his time before, you know, he makes his announcement to the 20th Party Cong Congress in February of 1956. Khrushchev had said that everybody in Russia knew somebody who had disappeared whether they had been tortured or executed or sent to the gulags and died there. Everybody knew somebody who had disappeared. And so it was, a, it was absolutely a, a society that was terrorized in a very real sense by Stalin's attempt at totalitarian control. Khrushchev's announcement of, was, of course, the announcement of de-Stalinization. When we refer to de-Stalinization, we're referring to the dismantling of the myth of Stalin. We're referring to um, actions like the renaming of cities, like Stalingrad, to its current name, Volgograd. We're talking about the, the removal, uh, the reburial of Stalin outside of, outside of the, um, um, the center uh, of, Red Square, of Red Square. His body was moved to the sort of the outskirts as, a, as a, almost like a symbol. Um, gulag, gulag prisons are relaxed. Uh, many people are released. The gulags still exist, but they were far less kind of prevalent and far less, um, far less um, inhumane than they had been during Stalin's times. Um, there's increasing openness about the crimes of Stalin. Um, society members like Khrushchev begin um, discussing the great purges, the role of individuals like Lavrente Beria, or Beria um, who's pictured here with Stalin's daughter Svetlana, and of course that's Stalin in the backyard, background, um, discussing the actions of Beria. Uh, Beria was, he, he oversaw the torture and murder of, of, of millions of people, and of course he would be executed for this, for playing his role um, as the Minister of Public Security, playing a role perhaps not unlike the role played by Robespierre during the convention in the worst part of the French Revolution. Berea was, um, was, was an individual who, who tortured people. And uh, um, in some cases, even the prison where you might be sent, um, there was a chute that would shoot the bodies out into the water in some cases. Many people, of course, were sent to the gulags and worked to death. But a discussion of these crimes, um, a discussion of these crimes now becomes... Um, accepted. What do you think some of the consequences are to that, to dismantling the myth of Stalin? What are the consequences of saying that, you know, Joseph Stalin, the leader in the 30s and 40s and early 50s, um, was in fact um, a brutal terrorist, basically? What are the consequences of that? Before I mention this, one of the consequences of de-Stalinization will be, despite the attempts of Khrushchev, uh, Tobman calls Khrushchev's actions um, both reckless but also courageous, um, Khrushchev is trying to remake Russia into a, uh, into a better place. Um, he's trying to take the Soviet Union um, into uh, an advanced state. Um, as, as a world leader. And part of this was, of course, demystifying Stalin, talking about the terror. And the consequence of that, we'll see in a little bit, is um, revolution within the Soviet Empire. But first, Khrushchev had an idea called peaceful coexistence. Um, this was one of 
Khrushchev's ideas for creating better relations with the West. And Khrushchev was in the West a lot during his leadership, and, and, and he hoped to create a more productive relationship in many respects between the West and the United States. Um, peaceful coexistence refers to Khrushchev's attempt for peace with the United States. Um, Khrushchev desperately wants to avoid the possibility of a nuclear war. It is something that he fears quite tremendously. So when Americans think, you know, for example, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that, uh, and we'll talk about that next week, when Americans think that, you know, the Soviets were madmen waiting to fire their missiles, it was in fact not true. In fact, uh, Khrushchev was as concerned and fearful of nuclear war as, as a leader perhaps could be. Very rational leader. This marked a, 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 also a Soviet, a, Soviet, a Soviet shift to an emphasis on proxy war, and this is another side of it. So in one respect, Khrushchev is talking about peaceful coexistence. He's talking about um, trying to create a better relationship with the United States and averting possible nuclear wars. But Khrushchev ultimately also oversees um, an, an expansion of the use of proxy war in the developing world as an agent of expanding the Soviet Union's sphere of influence against the United States' efforts, to, of course, to do the same thing. Khrushchev was nonetheless genuine uh, in terms of his overall seeking a better relationship with the United States, and he traveled to the United States on a number of occasions, particularly in 1959, most significantly, um, as a way of showing his humanity. He traveled to other parts of, uh, of the Americas, but in 1959, of course, he famously comes to the United States um, during the so-called kitchen debates um, with Richard Nixon. And, you know, he, he, he wants to show himself as a real person in some respects. He wants to market the Soviet Union in some respects. Um, but Khrushchev had a way about speaking. He was kind of had an Eastern European style, if you will. And so he tended to speak very forcefully. He was very animated. And in some respects, this shocked many Americans. And, of course, later, during um, the crises involving Cuba, during the early 60s, of course, Khrushchev becomes uh, synonymous with his taking his shoe off and beating it on the table at the UN. And uh, those implied to the Americans that this was kind of a, a madman. But in reality, Khrushchev was a very rational, hum human, humane thinking person. He, he wanted to create a better world. And, uh, um, but his appearance sometimes shocked Americans as he would... Uh, in the one case, beating his shoe on the table at the UN or, um, you know, at the kitchen debates, speaking very forcefully. He liked to smack his hand and point, and he was very, he was flamboyant in his speaking. Um, and, and a lot of Americans were shocked by this. They, they didn't understand Khrushchev. In 1956, when Adelaide Stevenson ran against Eisenhower, it could have been a chance to end the Cold War. There have been historians who have suggested that maybe it was. Um, and one has to look at because Adelaide Stevenson was a peace candidate who ran on promoting uh, a similar idea as peaceful coexistence. Um, of course, ending the Cold War in 1956 may have, may have been easier um, said than done. But nonetheless, of course, capitalist countries and communist, at least communist party leaderships can coexist. Um, today, of course, China, the Communist Party is the leadership in China. The Communist Party is the leadership in Vietnam. And of course, the United States has productive relations with, uh, albeit controversial at times, uh, we nonetheless have coexistences with these countries. Um, granted, they, 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 became, they became capitalist economically. Um, after the death of Mao, um, Deng Xiaoping, the uh, Chinese leader who replaced Mao in the 1980s, um, really created the development of the modern Chinese capitalist system. And today, um, China might be led by the Communist Party, and there might be a sort of totalitarian attempt at control when it comes to individual liberties and freedom of press and speech and, and these types of things. But nonetheless, um, they've adopted, a, 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 in terms of capitalism, a very laissez-faire capitalist approach, as I'm sure each of you are aware of. The effect of totalitarianism and de-Stalinization on the Soviet Empire was resistance, particularly in Poland and Hungary in 1956. Um, Stalin, uh, under Stalinism, countries like Poland were, were ruled by Russian-appointed leaders, um, Russian, like Bolsa Beirut, Be, Bolsa Beirut uh, we'll mention in a second. 
uh, was a Stalinist leader in Poland. He was Polish, but he was a Stalinist-style leader. Um, in many cases, um, people in these countries had to learn Russian, and their leaders were oftentimes Russian. And so they were incorporated into a, um, into a Soviet communist system rather than being allowed to develop their own communist system. And in some cases, their own communist leaders who resisted kind of being Sovietized, in some cases were executed. The problem with Khrushchev's denouncement of Stalinism is that it causes revolt and resistance in places like Poland and Hungary. It encourages them. Khrushchev is denouncing Stalin for, for, for terrorism, and it encourages them to step up and assert their individualism, their national independence, if you will. With that said, other areas like Bulgaria and Romania actually saw a kind of entrenchment of the Stalinist totalitarian model. But nonetheless, in Hungary and Poland, there's distinct nationalist challenges to Soviet control. And these challenges that began in the 1950s, they, they really bring us to a question, you know, how did the Soviet, why did the Soviet empire collapse? Um, I can assure everyone that the collapse of the Soviet empire is not as simple as, as Ronald Reagan in the late 80s saying, tear down this wall. Um, it was a long collapse, and I, I think that the answer here, if you look at these types of things, the answer to why the Soviet Empire collapsed um, has probably more to do with problems in the Soviet system and the Soviet Empire than with things that the West did, per se. Um, I, I actually took a, a graduate course from, uh, this was when I did my master's degree 10 years ago, and uh, I took a graduate course from a, an individual who was a CIA member of the CIA, and he had been stationed in Moscow uh, in the late 70s. And he said that the Soviet Union collapsed in on itself. He said that the apparatus of this kind of totalitarian control, the problems with a planned economy, um, had caused fractures within um, the country. And I think when you look at resistances in Poland and Hungary in 1956, um, that bears fruit or, or you know, kind of rings true. Um, of course, neither Poland nor Hungary are able to obtain their independence, um, but they were steps towards establishing um, their national independence that would, of course, ultimately occur. Why do you think, you know, as you look at this map here, um, you can see Poland and you can see Hungary just below Slovakia. This is, of course, a current map. Um, why do you think that the Soviet Union needed to oppose the independence of these states. I mean, why not just allow Hungary to become independent? There's really two basic reasons, and in a lot of ways, the reasons are similar to the same reason why the United States could not have West Germany or France become communist. Um, because of political ramifications. Soviet security uh, was, was integral to their decision that, that the Polish uprising and the Hungarian uprising would have to be put down. Uh, the Soviet Union, like the United States, had their own domino theory. And the domino theory, if you guys aren't familiar with that term, the domino theory was a term that suggested that if you weakened, if you showed that you could not, um, that you could not control or in the case of the United States, contain the Soviet Union, that the result will be a loss of psychological will on the part of your allies. And it's kind of similar in, in the Soviet system, in the, in the Soviet empire, in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. There's a fear that if you allowed Poland to successfully revolt, or you allowed Hungary to leave the Warsaw Pact, that it would encourage other resistances, and it would create a domino effect that you would ultimately be unable to to, to, to halt because it would show that you were weak. In reality, I think most historians would say the domino theory was largely based on a lot of fear for the United States and for the Soviet Union, um, but there was probably not a whole lot of actual evidence to say it was true. Certainly when we think about the United States' uh, domino theory, uh, when we think about Vietnam, for example, there's little evidence to suggest that had the United States not fought in South Vietnam that um, the entirety of Southeast and South Asia would be lost to communism. Um, there was little evidence for that, but of course that was what motivated the United States. And, and the United States was motivated around the idea in Vietnam that we had to make what John Foster Dulles called a good stout effort 
meaning that we had to, even though there was a 50-50 chance of success, as he saw it in the late 50s, the United States nonetheless had to, had to, had to, had to try to fight for, against communism and contain communism because we had to send a positive message to our allies. And similarly for the Soviet bloc, they believed they had to have this Eastern European buffer zone for resources, and the other reason, economics, the satellites in the Soviet Union's economics were intertwined. They feared losing them and losing them to Western states. They feared this um, kicking off a string of revolutions that would suddenly cause the Eastern European buffer zone to collapse and leave Russia exposed and economically vulnerable um, um, to kind of a, a insertion of the United States or the Western uh, influence into the region. So these are the reasons really why um, Khrushchev, despite what he says about de-Stalinization and despite what he says about uh, the importance of revealing the myth of Stalin and his terror, um, Khrushchev nonetheless cannot have these states become independent. The Polish uprising began in June of 1956, and it began when workers in the Stalin metalworks in Ponzan, Poland, ironically, I say ironically because we think about communism and communism is supposed to be about the workers. And so it's ironic when um, a revolt within the Soviet empire occurs because of workers striking um, and demanding bread and better wages because you don't expect that. But, um, but that was the case. They demand better wages and working condition working conditions, um, they march and they riot and they attack government buildings and demanding that, uh, that their wages and conditions be improved. The Soviet general, um, Konstantin Rok Rokos Rokosk, oh, that's just ridiculous. I, I can never pronounce that word. I apologize. And I'm not going to try again. <laughs> um, the Soviet general, um, who was stationed there was, um, responsible for ordering the uprising to be crushed. And it was to be crushed quickly. And the reason why was because of a fear that this could spread. 10,000 soldiers and tanks are moved into Ponzan, Poland to crush the uprising. Um, about a, 57 to 100, we don't know exactly, are killed. Nearly 1,000 are arrested. And Polish communists increasingly push for the rise of Vladislaw Gomułka into power as a reformist within the Soviet system. Vladislaw Gomułka is a Polish communist, but he's a reformer. And so this is a moment in which, in ways, Poland achieves some important positive steps forward in achieving um, um, some level of, of self-government and independence within the Soviet system. And that is what Vladislaw Gomułka will promote. Um, Konstantin Rakovsky. There we go. <laughs> so de-Stalinization had encouraged the Poles to rise up against direct Soviet control. It was also brought on by the death of Bolsar Beirut, who was a Stalinist communist who had been leading in Poland, and his death opened kind of a vacuum for political leadership in the country. Um, again, the, the Poles demand things like greater religious freedom, because after the Stalin, Stalin metalworks uh, protest, it spreads across the country. Um, the, metal work, the workers in the metalworks were you know, often looking at primarily working conditions and these types of things. But it, 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 it expands into a promotion of Vladislaw Gomułka and a reform within the Soviet system, um, Polish reforms that, that demanded greater religious freedom, openness, like de-Stalinization, about things like the Katyn massacre, um, the molotov ribbentrop Pact, which the Nazi-Soviet Aggression Pact, which allowed for Poland to be sliced up. Um, a failure of the Soviets to support the Warsaw Uprising. Um, they want an end to Russian language education. Um, they want greater political and economic freedom, and they want Gomułka to be allowed to, to, to remain in power um, as of his uh, ascension in October of 1956. And this is Gomułka um, speaking um, as he was positioning himself in power as a Polish reformer within the Soviet system. So the Poles want, you know, they want an end of kind of totalitarianism in Poland. They want greater religious freedom. Um, they want the Soviet Union to be open about the ways in which the Soviet Union were, in a lot of respects, almost as bad as the Nazis in Poland for executing intellectuals, for signing an agreement with the Nazis that basically allowed for Poland to be sliced up as though it was for the taking during World War II. 
They want, this is a largely Polish nationalism, um, even though it is directed through Polish communists and through a, a kind of reform within the Soviet system, it is establishing a movement towards what becomes ultimately the development of independent and modern Polish nationalism. Khrushchev was, of course, desperate to hold the empire together, and so he does compromise with the Poles to a degree and allows some greater freedom. Um, the greater freedom, the attainment of many of these demands, um, scholars regard this as similar to Poland's move from the position as of colony to dominion in the Soviet bloc, meaning that they go from being, being a colony in which their leaders are effectively appointed to them, in which they're effectively told to adapt and become like the mother country, if you will, to a case in which Poland was allowed to become a more individualistic as a nation, a more independent um, nation within the Soviet empire and sphere of orbit. So Khrushchev's desalinization causes some problems for Khrushchev. And um, Khrushchev here had to compromise a little bit and allow Poland to become a little bit more independent within the Soviet sphere. The Hungarian re revolt has a little bit of a different um, character to it, uh, and it doesn't have the same kind of um, reformist end to it. Um, there are some reforms, but it doesn't have the same kind of, in a way, the Polish uprising has more of a happy ending. The Polish people get their reformer, um, they get a lot of their um, freedoms and the Hungarian revolt is, uh, is 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 not it's put down with 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 much greater force. Um, Hungary, um, Hungary was uh, really inspired by the Polish uprising, um, and of course Hungarians had very much seen the repression of the Soviet Union. Um, in October of 1956, there was a hundred thousand who came out to mourn uh, the reburial um, of Laszlo Rajic. And he was, a, he was a Hungarian communist. And that's an important thing. He's a Hungarian com communist who resisted being a Soviet communist. He had his own Hungarian sense of communism. And, and he was ultimately executed for, um, um, for, 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 for being a potential opponent to Sovietization in Hungary. Um, Individuals like Amir Naj um, in Hungary, the, the, uh, this is Amir Naj right here. Um, Amir Naj uh, proposed something with communism with a human face in which Hungary would become, a, it would be a communist state, but it would be a communist state that great, gave greater kind of leniency to individuality and, 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 and humanness, if you will. Um, over a period of weeks, uh, riots um, and, and protests occur in Hungary. Stalin's statue is torn down in Budapest. The flag that you see above Emir Naj, um, the circle cut out, is a cutting out of the, of the, of the communist insignia, the Soviet insignia within the Hungarian flag. And that's, that flag with the hole in it becomes a symbol of the Hungarian revolt. Soviet tanks ultimately are called in by Khrushchev into Budapest. Um, troops fire on protesters. The, t the tanks enter Budapest with an ultimate show of force. And ultimately, Naj, Emir Naj, um, comes into power, uh, is placed in power as a communist Hungarian reformer, kind of like a Vladislaw, a Vladislaw Gamukla character. And the Soviet tanks then leave on October 30th. They will, like the Polish situation, tolerate the new government. However, on November 1st, Emir Naj comes out with a bombshell announcement. And that was that the Naj government would withdraw from the Soviet bloc and become a democracy. How well do you think that went over for the Hungarians? The answer is correct. Um, not very well. Three days after Emir Naj's announcement, a thousand Soviet tanks enter Hungary. Force is used. The revolution is crushed. Naj will appeal to uh, the United Nations and no one helps. He will be arrested and secretly executed two years later. This was all over the news. Everybody knew about what was happening. I mean, everyone in the West knew about what was happening in Hungary. And refugees crossed from Hungary into Austria um, 
as they tried to escape the Soviet um, ultimate, the, the crushing by the Soviet Union of the Hungarian revolt and of the Hungarian attempt to become an independent democratic state, um, like was the case with Yugoslavia, which was an independent democratic communism. I think one of the big questions is, was the world's paralysis on this acceptable? Should the United Nations and or NATO come to assist Naj and Hungary? I think the easy answer for that is yes, but I think that's, that takes for granted the difficulty of this situation. Um, if the United Nations and, and NATO had, um, had taken some form of military action, it's difficult to imagine there not being a direct war with the Soviet Union. So it was a very difficult situation. So de-Stalinization had some real great and bold ideas from Khrushchev. In a lot of respects, Khrushchev wanted to be um, a more humane Soviet leader, but de-Stalinization unleashed revolts. And in some cases like Hungary, these revolts from Khrushchev's perspective had to be crushed. Um, and so it tells us something about the nature of the Soviet empire. The nature of, of Soviet attempt to control this empire with almost direct and colonial force. In some respects, in, in, in October, November 1956, we see the first fractures in the Soviet empire. I hope this is helpful, guys. Let's have a great week.